any questions, I'll just actually I just wrote down one. I thought I I kick one off actually because. And it's, it is sort of for you, Sebastian, although it might also be for you, Lord Rusdale, as well, which is, I assume it's kind of deliberate that the Treasury are taking the lead as opposed to um, uh, the DECC. Um, I'd be interested in what you've got <laughs> What's the political this, take, but yeah. My, but my sort of take on this is Gorgeous George is kind of driving everything at the moment because you see all of the main... Uh, drivers in planning and environmental legislation coming out of Treasury. Um, you may know more than I do. Yeah, we're, we're on the working group of, of this. It, it's definitely coming from Treasury. Um, it was uh, mooted by um, George Osborne in the, uh, in the autumn statement of bringing them together. But actually, I think it's, it's going to be a rather interesting thing because you merge them all together. The problem with CCAs and CRC is they don't do what they actually were set out to do. They, they've all morphed into the, I mean, CRC was an abatement scheme. They, he's turned it all into a tax. It's all going to be down on CLC. So it'll be coming out of CLC. You're going to be merging uh, gas and electricity probably into the scheme. Uh, he'll get a higher tax rate from CLC. He doesn't like the idea of capital allowances, um, although he might put training in energy efficiency against any tax. Um, one of the, I think one of the benefits for energy managers, though, is you're going to have all these taxes in one report, so it's going to match up to ESOS as well, once a year, and they'll probably mandate it, because GHG and CRC are mandated, to go in front of a director for sign-off. Now, I was talking to one of the big supermarket chains, and they said, so we've got to stand up in front of the board and put a bill for 17 half and a half million quid in one lump sum. And that'll probably do quite a lot. They'll say, how do we avoid this tax and go spend on energy efficiency? So that's when it comes back to the CapEx, OpEx thing. Suddenly, uh, once you realize how much you're spending on energy, uh, energy efficiency measures uh, suddenly become much more exciting. Good. Have you have you on that as well, Stephen? Well, I think you know we ended up with a kind of aggregation of scheme after scheme, and none of it really fitted together. So I think I sort of welcomed a reform, um, and I think on balance, you know, that the thing Rupert said was, was a real positive thing. Though on balance, if it gives energy managers more time to develop real projects rather than spend their time filling out CRC and every other kind of report, that's got to be a good thing. Uh, ju yeah. Just on that, um, so uh, Nico Haslop, who's been running this from the Treasury, uh, he spoke at our conference last week, and we've the energy managers have got together and said, we'll write the report for you. And then fantastically, as the government's shrinking, they're trying to get other people. We don't see why it has to be a complicated report. CRC was incredibly complicated because you were trying to fill in all these other things. GHG can be made very simplistic, so you could actually have a four or five page document uh, rather than this a massive amount. The one thing we're worried about is making sure you don't lose all the detail in a very simplified document because it should be useful for the company to know where they're actually spending the money on energy. Yeah, good, thank you. We've got any other questions? We've got a, a mic coming down behind you. Uh, Benjamin from Energy Deck. Uh, Stephen, I'm not sure if you were there earlier at my presentation. I did a bit of uh, future gazing, and um, so you might have seen my sort of take on it. But um, where do you th where do you see the investor confidence project in five to ten years? Say in terms of scope, impact, and and those things. If you think about it, and, and sort of a bit more concrete, if you think about it, like an assets under management uh, number for project assets or project volume under management. What what's what's your vision on that? Where it can go. Well, I think the, the, the vision is most building energy efficiency projects being developed using those kind of protocols, the ICP protocols, and lenders and investors saying we will only lend to projects that are developed using those protocols. And you know, let's be clear, the protocols are best practice plus a little bit, and they have a number of benefits. Um, and we're already seeing that in the US, where some of the green banks are saying, okay. We understand this. It makes our life easier. We can link the M and V direct to um, debt service coverage, so that we know if the savings go down, the M and V sends a signal to the loan officer 
obviously not an energy signal because they won't understand it, but it says, watch out, you need to do something here. Um, so very much, you know, the norm. And I think the whole idea is to make it an investable asset class, you know, like renewables or power or real estate asset classes. And, you know, we talk to more and more big investors and banks who say, we really, really do want to put money into this. And, and I think the shift in the subsidies has been helpful, certainly in the UK. You know, and, and the kind of slogan that I'm using is, uh, you know, out of renewables and into retrofit. And they want to do it, but unless the infrastructure is there and the systems and the processes, they can't build this capacity to lend significant amounts of money. But, you know, the more and more big investors are saying, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's kind of adopt it. And do you think it can get to the levels where energy performance contracts are today? Is there like 15 billion in the US? Yeah, well, I, I think, I think you know, again, come back to my kind of question marks over energy performance contracts. You know, why do you have an energy performance contract and a guarantee in an energy performance contract? You only have a guarantee because you're uncertain about the results. If we have more actual measurement of results and open data, and again, that's again another trend about open data about how projects actually perform, then you have more confidence in the results, so you don't actually need a guarantee. And by the way, you pay a fortune for that guarantee, which is one reason why they've never really taken off in the commercial world, because the commercial world sees, sees that. Um, so there is a link there. You know, if you have more confidence in the results, it's like, do I need an EPC? Question mark. OK, probably time for one more question. David. David. Question to the panel, but probably Stephen mostly. Um, with commercial real estate, we've got you know, landlord and tenants. So the, the structures you're developing with ICPE, are they primarily arrangements that would be put in place? Sorry. Are they primarily arrangements you'd put in place by the landlord or the tenant, or could it be a mixture depending if it's single or multi tenant? Well, I think I need to separate out two things. I mean, ICP is about projects, and a project is a project is a project. Uh, and at one level, the ICP is completely indifferent to the contract structure that you wrap it up in, who the client is, where the money comes from, actually don't care. It's just about developing better quality projects. That's the ICP. The other stuff is about business model. And one of the problems that EPC has in commercial real estate is exactly that kind of you know, split incentive, which we've been talking about for 40 years. And I think if you, you switch more to a uh, kind of pay for performance model, then you have the option of actually going to the tenants and saying, well, we can do things in your space, and, but you have to pay for the performance. Yeah. You know, and the, it, so it takes it out of that incentive. It, it has the potential to resolve that issue. Um, I'm not saying it's the answer to everything, because nothing is the answer to everything. But I just think it, it, it gives you more chance of solving that, because you could apply it to the, to the tenant space and say, give the tenant a choice. Yeah, St Stephen is really our expert on this, but the truth of the matter is it can be driven by either party. Mm. The difficulty is, as I say, where the incentive is not even, and certainly in complicated multi-layer properties, you can very rapidly get bogged down in a complete in a complete mire, which is why a long run-up and starting with as clean a sheet as you can get is often the, the key to even getting started. Okay. But there is one, one thought. Why is the tenant even getting involved in this. Why shouldn't the tenant turn around and say, I will buy a unit of light, I will buy a unit of heat or air conditioning? If you get to that model, everything's on the, la on the, uh, the building owner and it's much cheaper. And I think that will happen because as a tenant, why wouldn't you? The, the market that, in the that States... That require a change in yeah, fundamentally most of the leases. But in the States, yeah. the market is very much for all-in uh, building occupier costs. Of course, mm -hmm. then you can't change the, the behaviour of the occupier, so it, it does make it quite quite difficult. But mm -hmm. um, our American uh, uh, occupiers coming to London are often a bit surprised how it works yeah. here. Mm -hmm. They just want to write one cheque, and as you say, pass the obligation back up to the landlord to do all the difficult stuff. Good. Yeah, I think the other area that the pay for performance model can can work in, you know, that, that landlord tenant thing is one side, but it also gives you the opportunity to turn it into revenue. And revenue is just inherently more exciting and more cool than cash savings. And again, as I've said a couple of times, it takes it out of the oh, you need to talk to the property guys, the facility managers, energy guys. Yeah, and however green the big organization is, at the end of the day, these guys are down here and they don't really have the clout that these guys have. 
when you start talking about revenue, you suddenly find yourself in a conversation with these guys. And that's a really significant paradigm shift if you can make that shift. But I think you can only make that shift if you have pay for performance. And happily can talk more about that in the break or any other time. Good. Okay. Thanks a lot. If there's, unless there are any pressing questions, we will move on, I think. So, yeah, well, so thank you very much to the speakers again. I thought that was very illuminating, I have to say. Thank you.